In the Elder Scrolls series, between the open-world RPG masterpieces of Daggerfall and Morrowind, and the pop RPG excellence of Skyrim, there's a huge void, a huge gaping, yawning abyss, a sort of emptiness. Um, okay, it's, it's not exactly empty. Oblivion is there. The Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. It's forever going to occupy the red-headed stepchild position in the Elder Scrolls series. It's, it doesn't have the correct popularization and dumbing down of the RPG qualities that made Skyrim such a success and allowed it to become such a hit with everyone, even casual gamers. But it doesn't have any of the old-fashioned RPG complexity that something like Morrowind had. It, it occupies this odd middle porridge kind of place. And too crazy for boys town. Too much of a boy for crazy town. The child was an outcast. Instead of being just right, this middle porridge is just wrong for everyone. In a video game, you really have to find your market and go for it with full force, instead of trying to find this neutral point in between. And I wanted to give a bit of an exegesis of my thoughts about Oblivion. This isn't any kind of official scripted review. This is just sort of the things that get my instincts going in my mind about game design when it comes to the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, and what I think they were trying to do and where they went wrong in certain places. And I wanted to talk about the obvious faults in Oblivion, the, the issues that really make me think, okay, from a game designer perspective, why was this done, why did they think this was good, and why did it go so wrong? Now, I didn't hate Oblivion or anything. It's not like it's a bad game, it's just that compared to its siblings, it's a pretty banal sort of waste of time kind of game. I'm going to be leaving annotations in the video description about all of the sections I'm going to go through, so this is going to be a long video if you want to skip through it. As I said, I'm going to ramble quite a bit during this video, so be prepared for that. If you want an official scripted sit-down kind of video about The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, this isn't it. This is more like a an exercise about game design and how it works in Oblivion and how it doesn't work. So with that out of the way, let's get started. It's hard to talk about Oblivion without some prior knowledge of the Elder Scrolls series, and I'm going to assume that in the viewer of this video, but even if you don't have that, I'm going to try to make things as easy as possible in case you're coming to this game for the first time, because this was the first Elder Scrolls game for many people, and may have unfortunately put them off the series because of it. The Elder Scrolls series is set in the magnificent high fantasy Empire of Tamriel, a world that encompasses a number of different races and creatures from different types of humans, like the Red Guard or the Imperials, different types of elves, like the Dark Elves, the High Elves, the Wood Elves, and a number of much more exotic fantasy creatures like the feline Khajiit or the reptilian Argonians. This empire is divided up by its kingdoms, each of which is primarily inhabited by a group of one race, but all of the races, like the Roman Empire, sort of intermingle with their imperial citizenship in all of the other areas. Each kingdom retains its own ruler or king, but he's subordinate in a feudal sense to the emperor in Cyrodiil. This game takes place in Cyrodiil, and if you heard the word empire, you might have immediately thought of Roman Empire. Empire, and that indeed is what the Empire of Tamriel, and specifically the Imperial Province and that race of people, is based on. The Imperials have a very Greco-Roman type influence, as seen in their Lorica-like armor or their headpieces, the swords that they have that look sometimes like a Xiphos, some like, sometimes like a Spatha. The Imperial Province of Cyrodiil is supposed to have a more Mediterranean-style influence, but in the first of many criticisms of Oblivion, the entire province of Cyrodiil, and thus the entire game is extremely bland looking. And it's not just because of the age of this game. It was made in 2006, by the way. It's because they just didn't try very hard to make it look distinct or unique. But they could have tried a little bit to make the houses or the buildings or something look like that, that at least add some flora or fauna that makes it look at all different from anywhere else. In Skyrim, by contrast, it looks very much like a unique Nordic settlement somewhere in Scandinavia. And there's weird wildlife like woolly mammoths or walruses running around, and it just feels very different. Unfortunately, it's not just the geography that's bland when it comes to Cyrodiil. The entire province just looks really terrible. The buildings are boring, the interiors of all of the dungeons are the same dull stone, the ruins all look alike no matter what they are, everything just looks the same. I don't know if somebody wanted to make it different, wanted to make it look exceptional in some way, but it just has a kind of extreme banality. The entire province just has a kind of, well, it just looks boring. And the setting 
in the style about something is important to get you interested in playing it. The style of Fallout New Vegas was very interesting. We're still in a desert-like wasteland like we were in Fallout 1 and 2, but the fact that we're in Vegas gives its own little zing, its own little twist of lime that adds a little something new or something extra to it that makes it worth trying. Cyrodiil just doesn't have that, and it's insulting to the lore of the Elder Scrolls world that they didn't try to make it look distinct in some way. So right away, I was incredibly bored by the way that this world looks. Turning now to the main story, you begin as you do in Skyrim and Morrowind as a prisoner who is freed from jail at the last second and set upon an important task in order to save the province and maybe the Empire itself. The opening sequence sees you accompany the Emperor himself, brilliantly voice acted by none other than Captain Picard, Patrick Stewart, and as you walk with him and his personal bodyguards outside of this dungeon, the Emperor is quite unexpectedly assassinated, and you are tasked with finding his bastard son who is now the official leader of the Empire. Once you actually get out into the province of Cyrodiil, there's a big problem which sort of has to do specifically with this game and sort of has to do generally with the Elder Scrolls series. You see, the Elder Scrolls games are not some sort of super story-focused RPG like Baldur's Gate 2 or Arcanum, Steamwork, and Magic Obscura. The Elder Scrolls are more of a medieval life simulator, and this concept is going to come up again at a number of points later on in this video, so remember it. And in this medieval life simulator, it's not so much engaging in a, an amazing story that occupies your time, it's more that you can pretend once you sit down in front of the TV that you're actually living in the Middle Ages. That you actually exist in a real-life medieval world with horses, walled cities, taverns, mead, swords, bows and arrows, the whole lot. And the actual importance of the main quest is considerably understated, to say the least. So the designers of this, and I don't want to feel like I have in past videos, like I'm like I'm putting words in their mouths or I'm imagining what's going on without really having any knowledge of it, but it seems like they really put the style, the setting, and even the main plot on a back burner because we really don't get to see much in the province of Cyrodiil being affected by the death of the Emperor. You get a few people here and there commenting on it, but it's not like anarchy is reigning in the streets, it's not like rebellious groups are attacking attacking the Empire to try to destroy it, we don't really see anything going on around it for the vast majority of the game. It feels exactly like if the Emperor was still alive. You can contrast this very strongly with the first Dragon Age game, where we're constantly being told that the Darkspawn are taking over more and more of Ferelden, and we actually get to see them moving farther and farther north towards the capital city, and some cities actually get destroyed along the way. It's not perfect or anything and could have been done better, but it's a lot better than just nothing. I mean, the Emperor is dead. This is going to be a titanic crisis. Everyone knows the Emperor is dead. Shouldn't the provinces be in revolt? Shouldn't everyone be up in arms? But no, life goes on as it always did, day by day. I mean, maybe that did happen during the death of some emperors in the Roman Empire, but typically the assassination of an emperor was a time of tumult and danger and worry for everyone. But really, everything just keeps going on tickety-boo. Everything's the same. And I really wish they would have changed that. As you go to find the Emperor's son, you run across the real main thrust of the story, which is the the Oblivion Gates, hence the title, Oblivion. Oblivion in the Elder Scrolls universe is a hell dimension that exists parallel to Tamriel, and occasionally, as you do, demonic creatures called the Daedra from this hell dimension try to cross over into our world and, you know, just generally run riot and rampage and kill and loot and hurt people. Your job is eventually going to be to hopefully restore the Empire to some state of peace and eliminate the threat of the Oblivion portals that could destroy the entire province, or maybe the empire, or maybe the whole world if they break in and demons start wandering around all over the place. And initially, I was intrigued by this, and I enjoyed my first journey inside one of the Oblivion portals. The Oblivion world is a suitably hellish-looking place, with a red sky, lava instead of water, horrible creatures, poisonous plants and animals. However, once again, there's a real problem with these Oblivion Gates, which is that no one seems to care about them very much. You'd think that a literal gate to hell opening up next to your town would be a titanic issue that everyone should have to deal with. Aside from a few barons that send you on random quests to close a gate or two, it's basically business as usual. You know, they might 
might make a random comment about the gate, but it's like the Emperor. No one really cares. How am I supposed to care if it doesn't look like the entire province is being sucked into the fiery pit of hell? And there's no sense of urgency, you know? You don't really have to do anything with these Oblivion portals for tens of hours of gameplay. You can just wander around doing other boring nonsense. There's a real game design error here, because I can imagine in the pitch room, the writer's room, where they're trying to come up with ideas for what's going to go on in the Elder Scrolls 4, someone says what if the shadowy gates of hell itself rip themselves open into the imperial province, kill the emperor, and set about trying to conquer the entire empire? It sounds really, really cool. Unfortunately, there is a horrible mistranslation between this idea and the reality around it. For some reason or another, they could never quite get it right. In the Diablo games, you have a much more horror vibe going on. It's clearly some sort of spooky nightmare that literally hell itself with the devil in the form of Diablo and his demonic hordes are lurking below the town ready to spew forth and kill everyone around them, and no one seemingly can stop it until a lone adventurer comes to town. But there's really no horror element to Oblivion. Everything just looks a little bit too sunny and happy. Everything is too pretty the rest of the game, and the Oblivion portal really don't have much of a fright factor because people, the demons aren't spewing out of them constantly running into nearby towns. They're just sort of lurking around them and if you avoid them, everything is okay. But once you actually begin wandering around this place, you recognize just how boring everything with these Oblivion Gates are. The monsters that you're fighting are called Daedra, and these demonic entities are, well, they're just not that frightening. The first thing that you fight, literally the first thing that you fight in this demon portal as you enter into the gates of hell itself, is it some sort of slobbering, drooling beast with a thousand eyes and a hundred claws ready to tear your soul apart like some Lovecraftian nightmare? No, it's a dinosaur. A freaking dinosaur. Yeah, I know they're called Clan Fears and they were in other games, but yikes, this is a dinosaur. I laughed out loud when I first came in here. It was so ridiculous, I couldn't believe it. This is what we're supposed to be fighting? This is what's scaring us? I mean, the hideous animatronic costumes that existed in that mid-90s show, Dinosaurs, were scarier than this. It's four in the morning. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sake, a dinosaur? And the other demons are not scary either. A bunch of them are actually essentially elementals. A fire elemental, a storm elemental, ice elemental, etc. Called Atronox. And the Atronox, they're just not scary. Elementals are not scary, and they're, they're something distinct from demons in my mind. So fighting them, and this is like 90% of the fighting you're going to be doing outside the towers in the Oblivion Gates, is just boring and silly. I just couldn't, you know, get into it. I, you know, the style was important enough to do right, and they did it wrong in Oblivion. The Oblivion Gates are divided into two sections, the exterior areas and the towers. The exterior areas are patrolled mostly by these elemental-like creatures, the Atronachs, with a couple of Daedra here and there, and the towers are mostly filled with the Daedra. My first few journeys into the Oblivion portals were fun, and I, and I thought that they were excellent diversions to the main world and contrasted very sharply with the more silly, high fantasy style of Cyrodiil. Tragically, though, the fact that you can do dozens of these portals throughout the game quickly leads you to realize that all of these portals are essentially the same. There's really just one portal that is slightly altered. There's three towers instead of two. That The towers are located somewhat farther away than usual. You have to open a couple of gates in order to get to the towers. Everything looks exactly the same, it works the same, and it quickly becomes a grind to bring down these towers. They are so dull and repetitive. Doing three or four is enough. Now, what you have to do when you get into the Oblivion Gates is naturally close the gate so the demons can't get out. Not that they were getting out really in great numbers, but never mind that. We don't visually see that, so whatever. In order to close the gates, we have to cross the outside area of Hell and get inside the towers. Inside the towers, we have to reach the pinnacle, and once there, we have to grab an orb. Yes, I'm not kidding. Just like in Castlevania, you have to mysteriously grab an orb for some reason. And what's interesting about this is that you have to kill nothing. 
Nothing is required to die throughout the entire tower. Now, of course, you probably want to to practice fighting and to grab extra loot, but if you use invisibility spells, you can just sneak through pretty much the entire tower, and really the entire level. And you don't need to fight some sort of epic boss at the end or do anything, and you just need to reach the top and grab the orb. It is so boring and so dull. I mean, it feels like a placeholder idea that they were doing in an early rough draft of the game before they polished it. It just becomes so tedious to go to the top of these towers and grab these orbs. It's the same thing over and over and over again. The same monsters. Terrible loot. You don't even really get that good loot when you go to these towers. It's, it's like middling, okay loot. And I would almost suggest that the game encourages you to sneak through the towers rather than fight, because in one main quest, journey into one of these Oblivion Gates. You have to complete it on a time limit, and as far as I know, there's not really a way to complete it in the specified time and fight the monsters. You really just have to run as fast as you can to the top and not care about what's going on around you. It's, it's ridiculous. Do they not want us to play the game, for heaven's sake? You're later tasked with saving the Emperor's son, restoring him to the throne, ending these Oblivion Gates, and figuring out why this happened in the first place. None of which, I have to report sadly, is very exciting. It's really just not fun to do any of it. I, I, I wasn't gripped by any of this at all. This was a huge game design flaw that just ruins Oblivion for me. The main quest, something that, at least in theory in other games, you should give the most attention to, is ridiculous. This is where the game design really, really fail. You can't create a main plot about a hell world taking over the kingdom and then not show it happening. You can't let normal things happen as the days go by when demons are supposed to be stalking the land. It sounded good in a meeting, and then they never expanded upon it. They never explored it. They never really let it reach its full potential. We just have this endless, it almost feels like a fetch quest to go grab these stupid orbs and close the gates. And because there are so many dozens of gates, it seems po pointless to do that, because more are always around the corner. The boring level design that becomes so repetitive with repetitive monsters means that, that even just from a purely gameplay point of view, going in there is dull. So, the main quest is an unfortunate failure. However, the main quest in Fallout 3 was, in many people's eyes, also an unfortunate failure, and yet, somehow, that game is still fantastic, and I agree with that. The main quest is not very good, but the rest of the game is excellent. They actually made the world interesting, the characters interesting, the quests that you went on outside of the main quest exciting and fun. So, if the main quest wasn't any good, and the setting really wasn't any good, what about the side quests? Because in the Elder Scrolls games, there really isn't as clear a distinction between the importance of the main quest and the side quest. You could happily ignore the main quest in Daggerfall about the ghost of the king forever and just mess around in Tamriel, and it was just as fun. So can the same be said for Oblivion? Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a mixed bag. A significant amount of the side questing is done through various guilds. The Fighter's Guild, the Mage's Guild, the Thief's Guild, and the Assassin's Guild, with varying degrees of skill put in into the writing. These starting tasks, I don't really even like to call them quests, just tasks that you have to do when you join the Fighters or Mages Guild, are really banal and not very interesting. You have to wander around and kill this, do that, bring this here, standard fetch quest kind of stuff. Later on in the Fighters Guild, you actually do get to do something really interesting. I don't necessarily want to spoil it if you haven't played the game, but you have to investigate a rival guild that has been snatching away business from the Fighters Guild and the, the and the way that you do that involving this weird quest about a destroyed village is actually pretty cool, but for the most part, the quests just lack any interest. They, they lack a lot of the fun. They, re they resemble the Fallout 4 quests in that they were really just kill this, do that, bring this here. Nothing really of substance to them. The Mage's Guild is probably the worst of all of the quests, which is sad because in Skyrim they actually had, I think, the best of all of these quests. But in Oblivion, the Mage's Guild is a joke. Like, literally, this has become part of the Elder Scrolls community to make fun of the Mage's Guild quest in Oblivion because of how ridiculous it is. Namely, you don't even need to know magic in order to join. Like, I don't think you need to have even one of your major or minor skills in magic. I don't think so. I know in Daggerfall, you have to have at least one of your major or minor skills in a magical ability to join these mage guilds, but I don't think you need to in Oblivion. You literally, that's like saying you can join the Indy 500 and not need to know how to drive a car. And I don't even think you actually need to use magic. 
I'm going to repeat that. You don't need to use magic in order to do mage guild quests. What if there was a Harry Potter movie where there were no spells? In fact, actually, I think the most recent one, there were no spells cast in the entire movie, which is a little strange, but never mind that. Now, the first few quests you go on for the Mage's Guild are boring enough. Uh, one of them I thought was kind of interesting, where you actually go into kind of a dreamscape inside of someone's head and try to bring them out because they were practicing some kind of dream magic. So I think that was actually pretty cool, but for the most part, it was banal. You know, bring this staff here, talk to this person, kill that. Standard boring stuff. When you get on to the main thrust of the Mage Guild quests, they are terrible, and I'm going to explain why. This is an important aspect of game design here, because on paper, in the pitch meeting, this sounds pretty cool. Necromancy has, for some reason or another, been outlawed as for its evil practices, I guess, in Cyrodiil. So the necromancers have been forced to go underground and create some sort of subterranean organization practicing their death magic, and are working to overthrow the Mages' Guild, all the while raising the dead from the grave and sending these corpses and skeletons to slay the living. It's it sounds pretty cool, but unfortunately, in translation, something is horribly lost. Just like a lot of other things in Oblivion, it sounds neat, but when you actually do it, it's terrible. A major reason for this is that the necromancers are not actually scary. If you actually wrote it down on paper, a necromancer is a vile magic user who rips the souls from the living and uses the hideous husks of their bodies in order to destroy their enemies. But in reality, the necromancers are pathetic nerds wearing black robes. Robes. Like, literally, the robes have no armor whatsoever. And if you practice your sneaking, which I was doing in this game, you can easily one-shot virtually any necromancer you come across. If you're really, really unlucky and they happen to catch you in the act, there might be a minor fight, but for the most part, there's really no challenge there whatsoever. You can just slay them instantly with a sneak attack. And they rarely even got to resurrect the dead in front of me, to be honest. Also, just like with the main quest, we don't really see or feel anything actually change in the world. Everything really remains the same. It's not like we're seeing skeletons rising from the grave or destroyed villages or anything like that during this quest. Nothing actually alters in the world, so you can just wander off and do whatever, and everything seems like it's going to be okay. Finally, and probably most importantly, is the leader of the Necromancer cult, the so-called King of Worms, which doesn't sound very impressive or threatening to me, but never mind that. He is supposed to be the evil mastermind behind all of this, and when you go to kill him, he is... Well, yeah, a dweeb in a black bathrobe. Not exactly very frightening, and he goes down almost instantly. And I really wasn't overpowered or anything at this stage. I just knew how to play the game and killed him almost immediately. It was dull. Skyrim recognized they had to start introducing boss fights into the game more often, and they're really, you know, this felt like it should have been a huge boss fight event, and it would have been in Dragon Age, Dark Souls, or Dragon's Dogma, but here it's just another random necromancer nerd that you just kill. And by the way, you of course have to fight him because this is Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion in a pitch black room that you can barely see anything in. Yeah, it's not exactly the most exciting thing in the world. Oh, and by the way, you do get to become the Archmage the end of this quest, which is pretty cool, but again, you don't need to actually know or do magic in order to do this. Do, do they let you become, the, do they let you win the Indy 500 if you don't know how to drive a car? I don't think so. Why do they let you become the Archmage? I mean, it's a little strange that they would just promote you based on merit instead of long service anyway, but really, you should at least know some magic in order to do that. And that is nuts. How did they, dis how did they do this? I don't really have all that much to say about the Thieves' Guild section. I do like the fact that you have to find it on your own. You know, there's not just a neon sign that says, here's the Thieves' Guild, inquire with Alibaba within if you want to become a thief. You have to bribe some of the beggars in the capital city and they'll tell you where you can find some of the Thieves Guild members. Upon joining the Thieves Guild, you spend a lot of time, as you might imagine, this being the Thieves Guild, robbing people. And I didn't find it particularly enticing or exciting because that's kinda not the character that I wanted to make, but I suppose it was basically the same as the, as the repetitive kind of fetch quest stuff of the Fighters Guild, just with the added stealth element requiring you to hide out in people's houses and sneak and pick locks and things. The story isn't particularly remarkable and, and involves a mysterious figure known as the Grey Fox, the leader of the Thieves' Guild and supposedly the greatest thief in all of Cyrodiil. You naturally become the leader of the Thieves' Guild and take over for the Grey Fox and you actually get his Grey Fox mask, which is pretty 
cool. But otherwise, I don't have too much to say about this. It didn't really wow me. It didn't irritate me, though, either, like the Mage Guild quest did. I will give high praise for some of the best missions I've ever played in the Elder Scrolls series, however, for the Assassin's Guild missions. Now, I came across this one a little strangely because I killed someone that had locked me inside of a most dangerous game style dungeon where I was being hunted for sport by my fellow human beings and I attacked him without warning when I saw this guy who locked me in there again. So I don't really think that should have counted as my one murder. You have to commit a murder, by the way, and then you're contacted by the Assassin's Guild and asked to join. I really feel like that's not quite the way it should have gone, but never mind. The Assassin's Guild quests are incredible. I didn't even know that I was joining the Assassin's Guild until I went to sleep and found this black-robed figure standing in front of my bed, and I was terrified. It was an incredible moment in the game. And he told me about joining the guild, and I loved these missions. Wandering around, figuring out secretive ways to kill people, or just charging in and destroying them, and paying off the guards was so rewarding and so satisfying and so fun, I just couldn't get enough of them. And the entire mission where you have to go down and discover how an evil assassin, an evil assassin? I guess that kind of, anyway, an assassin who has turned against the assassin's guild is trying to kill everyone. An assassin of the assassins who's turned against the guild in order to find and destroy the semi-mythical deity that runs the assassin's guild. And it is an incredible experience. It's so fun and so spooky and so scary. I really, really recommend it. It was the best thing I ever did in the entire game. I loved these assassin's guild missions and figuring out what's going on and the mystery involved, and what you see at the very end is extraordinary. And naturally, you get to become the head of the Assassin's Guild and set out contracts for people and get money for them. It's some of the best things ever in the game. Unfortunately, that was only one of the four main guilds and really the only one that was extraordinary in any way. Most of them were either banal or so int intermittently interesting that they couldn't really hold my attention over hours and hours of playing them, and they didn't really reach satisfying conclusions conclusions, if three out of the four didn't anyway, they were in general pretty boring. Turning now to something where I think that the community tends to be united in criticism of Oblivion, the user interface. And oh my goodness is this horrendous. Compared to Morrowind and Skyrim, it is horrible. It's atrocious. And I was shocked into speechlessness when I heard that it was specifically designed in order to be used on consoles. Because Oblivion is a console game, first and foremost. And yet, it, 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 it's, it's horrible. It, it doesn't work well with anything, with PC or with consoles. It takes forever to find anything. Why in the world do you have to go through all of these keys? Thankfully, in Skyrim, they made keys their own section, but you have to go through like a hundred different keys. That every key you've collected in the game to get to the bottom of this list just to find a torch. Something that, remember the lighting section, you may need all the time. It's horrible to navigate through, and I hated every second of it, and I think anyone who's played this game would say the same thing. I don't even really think I need to say more. Just play it for five seconds, and you'll see how clunky, clumsy, and poorly designed this thing is. Speaking of the fact that this game was designed for consoles, is the fact that the loading screens are enormous! Oh my god! God! I mean, in a game like, say, Demon's Souls, where the loading screens are pretty horrendous, I can understand why that's not going to be much of an issue, because you're going to be going to one area, and then potentially exploring it for hours and hours before going to another area. But in the Elder Scrolls games, the quests that you do will involve you teleporting back and forth, fast traveling throughout all sorts of different areas all the time. Fast travel is an enormous and necessary thing for some of these quests some of which are ridiculously designed to go back and forth and back and forth for no reason, especially the Fighter's Guild quests, I think, had this. To go through these never-ending loading screens, I mean, my goodness, and even running around, I mean, this is the Xbox 360 version I'm playing, and my goodness, the game seems to load constantly. Like, it's just loading perpetually. It never ceases loading. And especially when you're on a horse and running around, I mean, it just seems like the game never stops loading in new textures. But geez, I mean, I, I can't I can't play the game. I can't run around without something constantly being loaded in. It's nuts. And these loading screens are so painful and so 
boring and so repetitive. You see them over and over and over again. I guarantee you if someone somehow recorded their entire 75 or 80 hour playthrough and just counted the amount of times they spent loading, it would be titanic. The percentage of time you'd spend loading would be enormous. Like 10 to 15 percent of your entire playthrough would just be you staring at a loading screen. Now if this was of course was on PC, this is not going to be a problem for you. But again, they designed this game to use on a console. And I played it on a console. That's how I engaged with it. That's how millions of people engaged with it. I think this is a valid criticism. I mean, my goodness, I can't stand this. How could you sit and watch these never-ending loading screens over and over and over again? I mean, my goodness. I mean, I know it sounds pretty petty to comment on the loading screens, but you see them so often, you think they'd make them look good. I mean, the Demon Souls ones at least looked good, for heaven's sake. So let's talk about an odd, persnickety issue I have with this game that I think really speaks more strongly almost than anything else to the game design issues with Oblivion, and that's light. Now, it stands to reason that video games, if they are indeed a visual medium, which they are, you would want to be able to, you know, see the video game. And yet Oblivion boldly goes against this because a significant amount of the time that you spend indoors, which is, you know, pretty much every dungeon or cave or castle that you go into, is not well lit. Like, at all. You go into these places, and it's like you go into an actual cave at times. It is extremely dark, and very, very hard to see anything at all. This is one of the greatest annoyances I have with this game, because it seems like such a small issue, like, oh, so the lighting wasn't done right, get over it. But no, lighting is vastly important in any video game. You have to be able to actually clearly and easily see everything, and when I go down into a dungeon, I just can't. Everything is too cloaked in the umbrella of night that to, for me to pay attention or see anything around me. What they're trying to do is mimic actually being underground in some sort of lightless tunnel. So, okay, fine. Do they give you tools in order to light your way? Well, of course they do, but they simply don't work correctly. The first thing that you can do is to use a torch in order to light your way underground. Seems reasonable enough. The torches that you use provide a good, clear, normal-looking light that adjusts well to the human eye. Torches have absolutely no weight for some reason, so you can carry huge numbers of them with you. So it's not likely you'll be trapped without one. You can have a torch in your left hand and a one-handed weapon in your right hand, but make sure to unequip your shield or else you'll simply put your torch away when you try to take out your sword. Sword. It's a little confusing, and I didn't like that. You know, that means that you simply can't use a shield in your left hand, and if you're an archer or a two-handed weapon user, you just, you can't have the torch out. It, it makes those builds extremely useless deep in the dungeons. Now, admittedly, you can turn the gamma way, way, way up, but why even bother to do this in the first place? And why is the default setting for the lighting so freaking low? It's to the point where you just can't see anything. I know this is a common problem in a lot of games, but I really didn't like this whole light thing. It just made running through these dungeons ridiculous until I had to weirdly make everything have a kind of ultra bright look with the gamma way way up. It just didn't seem right. Suppose you don't want to use the torches and you want to use magical light. Well, okay, we'll use the magical light. But unfortunately, it's also terrible. Number one, it barely lasts any time at all. So even if you have a heavy magic using build, you're gonna have to be using this thing over and over and over again, or use a more powerful light spell that drains a big chunk of your magicka away, which means that if you're like a mid-level spell sword kind of character, you're going to be erasing a huge amount of your magicka every time you use one of these things, or you're going to be stuck using one of the basic level light spells that last like 30 seconds, and you have to cast it over and over and over again. I got to level 100 skill level with illusion in this game because of all the time I spent casting light spells, and it doesn't even look good. The one Skyrim looked great. It had a kind of Harry Potterish kind of look with the magic coming off. It, it felt right. But in this game, it's like turning on a neon light bulb, and you either get green or blue, just depending on the power that you have and the spell that you cast. And so you're just going to have to be watching the entire game in a horrible neon green or blue. It's, it's not pleasing to the eye, and it's absurd. Why did they not realize this was a problem? I mean, surely they must have tested the game, right? They must have actually played it occasionally and recognized that, 
whoa, 99% of these quests, when you're going into dungeons, you, you can't see anything, and when you try to see something, everything looks awful, even if you use a light spell. The fact that this is even an issue at all in the game is nuts. I can't stand that this is, that, that, that this is a problem. And I want to stress that this is not some tiny little issue with the game. This is a major, major visual impact that your entire game is going to have. Unless you're outside in full day, you're going to be wandering around these labyrinthine dungeons in total blackness. Oh, by the way, all enemies don't need light either. They can instantly discover and kill you even without light. So it's not like you can use it against them or anything. Oddly enough, all the way back in the first Elder Scrolls game, Arena, light was an issue as well, and they fixed it in Daggerfall. And light wasn't really an issue in Morrowind or Skyrim. It's just this game. Just this red-headed stepchild of the Elder Scrolls series that got this wrong. I, I mean, I can't even play the game without this constant irritating annoyance of casting the light spell over and over again. I mean, it, it's not even like a challenging adventure survival aspect of the game. It's just dreary and boring. It worked in the Fallout games because you can just click on your Pip-Boy light and you can see your way. Everything was fine. But constantly having to figure out a way to use the light is just ridiculous. And it's something that they solved in other games by either not making darkness an issue, like in the Dragon Age games, or giving you a lantern that you can just put on, like in the Dragon's Dogma games. It's totally nuts. It was done way better in every other game, and it just really frustrates me because it's hard to play this way. Another issue which I think speaks to the strange and inadequate skill of the game designers here are horses. Now, horses have long been a part of the series in order to facilitate travel between areas, but there's a big issue with using these horses. Number one, it doesn't necessarily seem very practical to use the horses, because unlike in the other games, you don't have to actually pay in order to fast travel between areas. And it doesn't really matter if time passes, because there are very few missions that have any kind of time constraint on them. Number two, and probably most important here, you can't attack from the horse. So again, it sounds like a good idea on the page. You can buy a horse and ride around, and ooh, isn't that pretty? You have a horse. But you can't actually fight enemies on the horse. Which means that because the world is scattered throughout with enemies left and right, you're always going to have to ride a few feet, encounter another enemy, get off and fight them. It is possible to run away from the enemies, but you don't necessarily want to do that. I mean, it's an RPG. Don't you want to fight some enemies? Did you buy the horse just to escape from combat? That doesn't sound like a very good reason to buy the horse. Why can't you attack enemies from on horseback. I can understand that certain skills are weakened or limited on horseback, you know, like your archery is less accurate or something, or your damage and your sword is less, but the entire point of having a horse in the Middle Ages is to use it for combat. I mean, until the horse collar was invented in the 1100s or something, you know, that was it. That was all that horses did was facilitate transport and combat. It just seems crazy that they did not code into this that you can fight from the horse. I mean, it seems like the entire point of having the horse, except if you look at the game, as I said, as a medieval life simulator. The point of the game is not to necessarily to have fun playing it, but to say to yourself, wow, I really live in the Middle Ages and I could even buy a horse. But they didn't actually sit down and say, okay, functionally speaking, how is the horse going to play? Because if you're going to a new area that you haven't actually discovered yet and thus can't fast travel to, it seems like a real issue why you would bother using the horse at all. Because presumably there are going to be all kinds of enemies along the way, and unless you just wanted to skip them, them, you're going to have to fight them, which means that every couple of feet you're going to have to ride with the horse, get off, fight the enemy, get back on the horse. And even more irritatingly, the horse actually participates in combat, and you can accidentally hit the horse a number of times and aggro it, making it essentially permanently hostile towards you, meaning you're going to have to kill the horse, which you spent hundreds of gold pieces on. And because you're going to have to do this over and over again, you're either going to have to be really, really careful with the enemies in every single fight, or you're just going to have to accept that you wasted money and turn your own horse hostile. This system just doesn't work out. There are too many faults here, too many issues with this for this to have made it into the game. It's just nuts. Like, there's no point to going on the horse. It doesn't even feel significantly faster than your character running. You know, I mean, it, it's, there's, why is this even here? It's crazy. And yet they couldn't figure out that something needed to be changed about these horses. Was this just done at an ad hoc basis, just tossing it in there? Like, who cares? Let's just throw these horses in, whatever. So we can say that there are horses. Although I do want to add here at the end that I absolutely loved my horse 
from the Assassin's Guild. I mean, this guy is just so cool with his pitch black mane and his red eyes. A grim steed, so fierce in might, and black in color, that he could stand as one. Save for his burning eyes and crimson fire. And the fact that he's faster than other horses, and I think invincible. I don't think this guy can die no matter how much damage he takes. And, you know, that's that's really cool. I, I love this horse. This particular horse. If only I could fight enemies while riding him, it would mean something to actually have him. This horse is pretty cool and a pretty cool reward for the Assassin's Guild missions. This next section is going to be the most controversial part of the video, I think, because it's the most relativist of all of the things here. The most where I feel like other people could clearly disagree with me about something, and I wouldn't feel as certain of being right that these are issues within the game. And that is the combat. Now, I wasn't in love with the combat in either Daggerfall or Morrowind, but both of those I think had better and more interesting systems, with Daggerfall being sort of a first-person, almost Doom-esque influenced feel, where you would move the mouse in the direction that you would want to attack, you know, you would thrust by moving the mouse forward or slash by moving it right to left, and Morrowind had just as sophisticated a system just adapted into a more 3D game environment. Skyrim has a much more action-oriented feel, where the combat is weighted, I think, correctly. It feels better when you fire a bow. It feels better when you swing a sword or an axe. And overall, I just felt much more confident and comfortable playing it. Oblivion, on the other hand, the combat, I think, is just wretched from my own personal perspective. It has almost the feel of a, of a child sort of bashing together two action figures. It feels that stiff and wooden. Firing bows and arrows feels com pathetically subpar compared to what it was in Dragon's Dogma, and the melee combat, I feel, is just wretched compared to what it was in the more action-oriented Souls games, which are much faster. You get the ability, for instance, in the Souls games, of course, to have a dodge roll, whereas in this game, you can technically develop a dodge roll if you have uh, the correct skills, but it only comes much later in the game, and it's not really all that useful. You don't really get the sense that you're getting iframes to avoid damage, and it's a little bit harder to do on the spur of the moment, so it's just not really as fun. Blocking, as in, in all of the Elder Scrolls games, games, unfortunately, is not as effective as it is in Dark Souls, because you never really get 100% block, and you have to practice over and over again in order to get your block higher and higher. And even then, it just sort of faintly stops the enemy, it doesn't completely erase any damage that you're going to take, making bothering to block at all somewhat questionable. It just ends up being incredibly frustrating, because combat is such a huge part of the game. It's very easy on higher difficulty levels to have your health raked away instantly by an enemy, and unlike in the Souls games, because you can't dodge roll, there's really nothing you can do about it. You just have to sit there and accept it, and hope they use potions to get away from it. And like I said, it's very difficult to avoid it if you're right there. It, it loses that dynamism of always having the ability to roll or jump out of the way, like you have in the Souls games. And it's just not something I care for. Because combat is such an enormous part of the game, something you're going to be spending so much time doing, it's incredibly frustrating to do this over and over and over again. And I didn't really find any particular style that I liked. Archery, melee, sneaking didn't really feel very effective. It was a little bit too realistic. You know, you could be found sneaking a little bit too easily. And unless you used invisibility spells, then you can be instantly undetected by almost anyone at any time. And unlike in the Fallout games, where you have to find these very rare items called Stealth Boys in order to make yourself invisible. Oblivion, you can easily just work your magic up over and over again on the illusion skill and get these incredibly powerful invisibility spells that make you almost totally undetectable by anyone. So again, I have to mention that I understand that there are probably people that are totally fine with the combat in Oblivion, but I hated it. It felt clunky, it felt clumsy, it felt slow, and I feel that about the melee in the, in the Fallout 3 and New Vegas games, by the way, too. It doesn't have that tactical quality that Dragon Age had. It, it doesn't have that visceral quality where the magic and the archery were really good in Dragon's Dogma. And it doesn't have that dynamism where you're always able to say to yourself, okay, I can roll out of the way, I can jump out of the way, I can get out of here, that the Soulsborne games had. You know, it, it just wasn't for me. So a huge chunk of this game is just something I can't get myself into. And please, if you like the combat in the game, I don't, you know, this, this is not about hating on the combat of this game. I want to hear about why you like it, why you enjoy it, why you think it's good, because I spent, you know, over 70 hours in this game recently, and virtually none of the combat did I enjoy. So, please tell me what you think about it and why, if you like it, you like it. 
One combat issue that they actually did better in Oblivion than Skyrim is magic. In Skyrim, you actually have to remove a weapon, you have to free up a hand slot in order to use magic. But in Oblivion, you don't have to do that. You can just equip the spell, and whatever weapon you have there, you just use your spell, even with the weapon still in your hand. And that's really cool, and it just makes it much more free and easy to use than the other one. We are constantly having to switch out your axe or sword or shield or whatever and readying your spell, whereas in this one, you can just use it whenever. So, and it's one of the rare things that Oblivion did better than its successor Skyrim. One final point about the combat in the game is that I just don't think it looks very violent, you know? I mean, we're engaging in a vicious sword fight here, and maybe I've been spoiled by playing a game like Bloodborne, but I mean, you know, the combat really feels kind of weak and pathetic. I don't really feel like I'm ch like I'm chopping into some guy's head here with a sword or a mace. Like, I'm, I'm too cognizant of the fact that I'm in a video game here and I'm just attacking pixels. There's no visceral quality to it. And speaking of visceral, in Daggerfall, you actually got to see like a twisted pile of guts and organs after you cut someone up, like in the Doom games that they were so clearly influenced by. Well, at least I think they were. But in this game, you just don't see that. It, it feels so... The entire game has a kind of vagueness or fuzziness to it where there's nothing distinct about it. It's one of the reasons why I kind of forgot this game for so many years. There's nothing really especially memorable about it. When it came to monster design, I really wasn't all that impressed. This was back in the mid-2000s where the models didn't look fantastic. I don't think they looked terrible or anything, but uh, it really... There was very little to stand out. I already mentioned how much disdain I have for the enemies that you fight inside the Oblivion portals, but I wanted to further mention that the actual Daedra creatures that you fight inside the towers are just humanoids, and they look like Darth Maul. Yeah, uh, this wouldn't have been appropriate in 1999 when The Phantom Menace came out. I mean, why? It looks so silly. Who thought this was a good idea for a demon? These demons are not scary. I mean, this guy is less scary than the dinosaur outside. And the fact that they're just basic humanoids really belies the fact that they're supposed to be something else, something other than what we see. Something completely alien and different as a demon, you know? it's The demons in Dragon Age looked really good. They looked like sort of monstrous representations of humanity's primitive feelings and instincts. This just looks... I mean, it's so basic, you know? It seems like a starting point for how you want to make a demon look. It doesn't have much even to distinguish it from a random human or an elf. The monsters that you fight in the world of Cyrodiil are also not spectacular. There are a couple of enemies that are unique and different looking, like the Minotaur, which may have hinted at a kind of more Mediterranean style that they were going for here or there, but it never really branches out. Most of the fauna that you fight are pretty standard West European type things like bears and wolves and of course, mountain lions. Mountain lions are some of the toughest enemies in the game. I'm not kidding, I had more trouble fighting these mountain lions half the time than I did with any of the demons. That's also another major game design issue here, because you can't have this real-world creature that you can go out and see in real life be physically tougher than the demons that are supposed to be taking over the world. Like, I had greater trouble fighting these. I don't know why, they're so strong and fast. They're just so much tougher to fight than these Daedra. I mean, geez, we should send the mountain lions against them. They'd win in a heartbeat. There really wasn't much else that I would say was a, a truly remarkable or interesting monster or creature. They, they just didn't show up very much. And in Skyrim, we got these weird dragon things, and Morrowind had all kinds of bizarre alien fauna running around. Maybe because the simplicity of the 3D models that they were using, or just the general blandness of the style, didn't let them really branch out and create anything that was in a design sense, unique or new, or a, an interesting spin on a mythological creature. The bestiary of this game is extremely poor. There's not really much you can find. Oh, I also wanted to mention something about the ghosts. Ghosts in this game are some of the hardest things I've ever fought in any of the Elder Scrolls games. They are extremely tough, very, very hard to kill, and, I mean, my goodness, they attack in packs. I went to this ghost ship once to try to find a treasure, and these ghosts just shredded me for level after level after level. Something I do like about the ghosts, though, is that they have an old-fashioned RPG thing here in that you can only damage ghosts and some other enemies with certain types of weapon, which is an old D&D thing, that, that you can only hurt some enemies with cold iron or silver weapons or some specific type of metal or else it does no damage. I, I really enjoyed that and felt that that complexity was kind of lacking in Skyrim when I, I don't think we needed that for fighting any of the Draugr or Undead in that game. That's the kind of complexity that I miss. 
Overall, though, we don't have any kind of fun, unique, and exciting monsters that make you go, wow, this is really cool and I'm living in this interesting fantasy world. Most of them are pretty dull. Now, turning to things I like about the game, it's not something that I specifically like about Oblivion, it's just really something I like about the Elder Scrolls games in general. So it's not really specifically for this game, it's kind of for all of them to some degree. I do love the variety of races that you can play as, and especially the Khajiit and Argonian or unique, monstrous races that are unusual in RPG set. I love the wide variety of classes, along with the fact that you can choose your own class. Leveling up in the Elder Scrolls series has a unique flavor to it. Not unique, it's been done in other games, but the Elder Scrolls games have a kind of uh, karate kid-like attitude about leveling up your skills. that even just practicing the skill in a vacuum without actually really using it will level up the skill. So you can just sit in a darkened room and cast a fireball spell over and over again for hours, and that will gradually improve your destruction skill. Sort of like how in the Karate Kid, you can just wax on and wax off with a car, and that'll magically make you good at karate. And you have to do this with a variety of different things in Oblivion. Notably, swimming, running, and jumping in order to make yourself better at all of those things. So you'll often see yourself wandering down the road, just jumping up in the air over and over and over and over and over again, and it just becomes kind of silly and repetitive and sort of like the casting the light kind of thing over and over and over again, which is just dreary and tedious and silly. When it comes to other issues, this actually works out. For instance, you get better at swinging your sword if you swing your sword so you get better at that. You get better at using a certain type of armor by getting hit. You get better at using a bow and arrow by actually firing it. It makes sense. But thankfully, by the time of Skyrim, they stripped out a lot of that stuff, like running and jumping to make yourself better at that, which I think was probably for the best. Even if you do this constant running and jumping and swimming to get yourself better at these skills, you honestly don't get yourself all that much better. It doesn't translate into feeling better when you do these things. You're your movement, like you're attacking, just feels slow and awkward and clunky. It's like the most maladroit thing imaginable. You are so stiff when you're running around. It's crazy. It's like the guy constantly has a crick in his neck and can't move. Like so much of the physical interaction that your character has to do in the game, maladroit. It's awkward. There's something wrong with it. They hadn't quite figured out the technology to make it better, like they eventually did in Skyrim. Even with all that criticism there, I do still like the idea of gradually improving your skills over time by using them. Even though it can lead to some weird situations where you gain levels very rapidly seemingly by doing almost nothing. You don't really necessarily achieve something. You just swing your sword over and over and over again and, you know, you magically just sort of level up. You can do this really quickly when you go into the Oblivion Gates, by the way. Something that I really do like about Oblivion, in contrast to Skyrim, is that they still have classes, and you still have the ability to pick, when you choose your class at the start of the game, a special power based on the sign, an astrological sign. They stripped this out in Skyrim, I think in the name of simplification, but I don't really think that worked. I think that complexity needed to be here. And the fact that they got rid of it is kind of annoying, and I prefer the system where you have skills like strength, intelligence, etc. Whereas in Skyrim, that's not really all that important. Just your race sort of gives you the beginning of where you are in your skill tree, and that's about it. And you can level up any skill you have at any time, rather than in Oblivion, where you pick major and minor skills that you gradually increase. It is a little bit weird that you gain a level when only those major skills that you have that you choose at the beginning of the game improve, but, like I said, I actually kind of enjoy that system, and I think it more or less works out, compared to Skyrim's oversimplification of that. This is one thing, at least, that Oblivion did better than Skyrim. Now, aside from these major quest paths that you can go on, the game does have some interesting moments that I really enjoyed. I actually went to a tavern that was actually made out of an old sailing ship, and when I went to sleep inside the ship, I woke up to find myself out on the ocean, and the entire ship had been hijacked by pirates, and I had to defeat the pirates and find my way back home. And that was a really, really cool mission, because it just came out of nowhere. And sometimes people will just walk up to you out of nowhere and ask you for something, or ask you to help with something, and uh, it's really exciting. It's not like every single quest is bad or anything, it's, it's just a ratio issue, with the huge proportion of dull quests compared to the interesting ones. There's another interesting one, by the way, where you can purchase a house in my favorite city, the town of Anvil. And when you go in there, you discover that there was a reason why 
why this huge house went for so cheap, because it is full of ghosts. And you have to defeat the ghosts and kill an evil necromancer at the in the basement before you can move into the house. It's a really cool mission, it's a lot of fun, everyone loves busting ghosts. But those are definitely the exception overall to the rule. I, I wouldn't say that the questing is as terrible as it was in Fallout 4, where there was just sort of a MMO-style fetch quest nonsense going on that really removed any sense of role-playing at all. There, there were some good quests here, but not enough. Not enough to spend 70 or 80 hours playing. So when everything's said and done, what can we really say about Oblivion? It is always going to be that red-headed stepchild in the Elder Scrolls series. That's something that's not quite right, doesn't quite fit in to the various niches that the other games had. The quests are occasionally great, but in a game of, you know, maybe a hundred hours, that's a small, small number that are worthwhile compared to the overwhelming mass of banality that you're going to come into contact with when you do a quest. To say nothing of the main quest, which is exceedingly dull, poorly executed, and frankly makes the entire thrust of the game and its very title ridiculous. The physical interaction with the game, the actual gameplay as you interact with your character, is slow, clunky, and doesn't really fit comfortably into any niche of action orientation or more complex, older action games like Daggerfall or Morrowind. It was a stepping stone on the way to Skyrim, but doesn't really have any of the achievements that that game has in terms of simplifying the gameplay and making it a more fun, pulse-pounding, modern action experience. The game still has this curiously old-fashioned style with really no boss fights in the game, and the ones that could be qualified don't have any of the hallmarks of a boss fight that you would find in a game with an added sense of operatic drama and extreme difficulty. They seem pretty much like fights in any other section of the game without all that much difference to them. Boss fights, I think, are an essential spot to a game that really lets you live up the drama of the moment and make you feel like you've achieved and changed and done something different. Skyrim gave you a boss fight very early on with a giant spider in pretty much the first mission that you get in the game. And there are a number of exciting boss fights scattered around, such as the boss fight against the, the old Amiri guy in the Mage's Guild quest, and pretty much all of the dragon fights are pretty much like roving boss battles that you could run into at any point, compared to the Oblivion Gates, which caused, at least me anyway, to sigh and feel like, oh great, another one of these things. There's not even any bosses in the Oblivion Gates. There's, like, one Daedra at the top at the tower, and you don't really even need to fight him. The games desperately needed these boss fights in order to, well, make the game a little bit more exciting, give it a little more pizzazz. The game, of course, succeeds in the level of a medieval life simulator, as mentioned before, and if you want to pretend that you're living in the 1100s in a fantasy, Tokian-esque kingdom, then you obviously can right here, and this is where you're gonna go to. Still, it feels a little bit more like The Sims than an RPG game. The music is also average, I would say, and doesn't really match, again, that unique quality that Skyrim had with the Nordic shouting choir. The reason I wanted to make this video is because I recently went back to Oblivion after a stay of many, many years just to experience it and see what was going on there because I didn't really remember it. And from what I found out, you know, I didn't hate my 70-so hour experience with the game. I didn't despise that. I had fun here and there. I definitely even loved some quests, like the Assassin's Guild quest, but far too much of it felt like chaff and there's really not even close to enough wheat to recommend playing this this game compared to Morrowind or Skyrim or, or even Daggerfall, which are very different experiences and much, much better overall. I also was inspired to do this because I saw when I was reading the Wikipedia page about Oblivion that some people consider this one of the greatest <laughs> games ever made. And oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> As far as I can tell, that was not the general opinion of Oblivion, thankfully. Uh, most people, I think, recognize its faults. But anyway, please tell me in the comments below if you think I'm ridiculous and you absolutely adore this game and how much you love it. Please tell me the criticisms of my criticisms so I can get better about this and see other perspectives. I want to know what you think of Oblivion and what your favorite Elder Scrolls game is. I would probably say my own is probably Daggerfall, but Skyrim's up there too. Where you think the game went wrong, where you think the game went right, uh, what 
what you would have changed with the game. I, I obviously could not talk about everything. There's It's a titanic game. I didn't talk about any of the DLC. There's all kinds of extra stuff that I couldn't go into, but this was also a fantastically long video as it is. So I can't, you know, I can't talk about absolutely everything. Uh, so please let me know your thoughts about Oblivion and what criticisms you've heard and how you feel it compares to the other games. I, I as I said, just think it's a clunky, clumsy, often banal experience that I just didn't really like. It didn't really hit me with that kind of style that I needed to pay attention to it, like the creepy alien world of Morrowind or the Nordic Viking Fest of Skyrim had. So please let me know what you want. I'm going to link a couple of videos here to some other RPG games that I've reviewed in the past, and please like, comment, and subscribe if you want to see more of these videos. I make reviews of TV shows, movies, and video games that I love. My name is Michael, and uh, thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank you.